So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rajesh Bansal with Carnegie India. I just uh, we'll just wait for a minute uh, for our audience to join in, and I should also say good morning for some people. I think some people are joining from Africa, some time zones. So good morning and good afternoon, and possibly good evening to some people. I'll just hold for a minute. Yeah, I think we will start. So a very warm welcome to everyone to this knowledge transfer session on digital payments and financial inclusion, where we have two esteemed speakers, Madam Chetna Galasena, which I'll introduce, I'll introduce both of them, and Raghavan Venkateshan. Before that, I just want to talk about, you know, I'm Rajesh Pansal. I am the senior advisor with Carnegie India. Carnegie India is one of the global think tanks uh, with its headquarters in Washington, one of the world's oldest. And Carnegie Delhi is the sixth center for Carnegie. We work on technology and society, political economy, and international studies. And this KT webinar series that we have is a monthly series where we discuss various topics for students, researchers, and talk about issues that help understand various you know, topics that impact us. So with this, uh, I would request my colleague to play a one minute video of Chetna, madam, please. audio digital banking digital banking required to remember yeah. thank you so much uh, for this so this was meant you know for two purposes one is to introduce the topic of where does financial inclusion and digital payment system, where do they work together? And a real story from the field, Chetna, Chetna Ji had said. So now to introduce the speakers, Chetna Ji, as you heard her now, is, a, is the chairman of Mandeshi Mahila Bank, a bank which honestly not many have heard of. I mean, I have heard of and met her a number of times. I know the good work that she has been doing. Yes, she's been doing that quietly in the field in rural Maharashtra. Uh, and she has been, you know, acclaimed as one of the most important women in empowering the tribal women in Satara and Kolhapur. She will talk to us more about what is happening out there and where do we go. And we have Raghavan Venkateshan, who's the co who's the founder of DGV, Dijivriti. Uh, he has had an interesting career being at National Payments Corporation of India you know, the India's payment company. Then he has worked at Access Bank, IDFC Bank, and at IDFC Bank, he built India's parallel banking, the most profitable rural banking business as we can know it. So he'll talk to us more about it. So to start the conversation, uh, can I ask Raghavan, could you tell us a bit more about, you know, what has been India's journey over the last 10 to 15 years 
in financial inclusion so that everybody all the audience every attendee is on the same page and then we can talk about current issues and then go into future challenges thank you rajesh uh, a very good afternoon to everybody um here in india and as rajesh says people are joining from africa so good morning and good evening as well uh, so india has had a very interesting journey over the last i would say 15 years i think it all started in 2006 when the regulator reserve bank of india took the first leap forward and came up with this business correspondent guidelines to help banks think beyond the traditional brick and mortar approach Uh, so between 2006 and 2010 we had a period of where uh, largely the solutions were offline um, had smart card uh, technology it was proprietary and it was all very hard wired so basically a customer of the bank could only use the access infrastructure of that particular bank think of it like how we used to how we are used to using atms i mean when we were using atms uh, almost uh, right from the beginning we were allowed to use each other's atm but mm -hmm. that concept had not yet percolated uh, in the bharat side but it was a very very good beginning i think that was the start and it started in andhra pradesh where the first set of uh, national rural employment guarantee scheme uh, payments had to be done Uh, using this branchless banking methodology uh, sometime in uh, 2010 2011 when npci actually npci started came into being in 2009 and rajesh uh, you know needs no introduction he is also a very a big name in what india has achieved on the india stack side uh, fortunately npci and uida coincided the same time and uh, i would say it was india's good luck that nandan was the chairman of uidia and narayan murthy was the chairman of npci so they both had worked together and there was a meeting of minds so it helped uh, npci and uidia collaborate between 2010 to 2013 to build up what today i mean we just saw chetna ji's video uh, leveraging the fingerprint was that we started working on standards so that mm -hmm. things can move from a proprietary technology to an interoperable framework i think that's where npci and uidia when they when they came together it was a fantastic uh, phenomenon and uh, we could uh, conceive what is today is the world's largest interoperable biometric payments network okay today so um rajesh we will all be very proud that aeps aadhar enabled payment system is the second fastest growing payment system in the country not many people think beyond upi but upi actually has only 105 million unique users but whereas aeps with 400 and million transactions a month is having close to about 200 million users yeah. so i'll stop you here for a minute because i'll come to digital payments options that exist in india and the challenges right. but for that the point you are making is that prior to 2010 it was an offline you know proprietary fi 1.0 if we can call it and right. from there moved to an online interoperable system where people right. could transact uh, at any customer service point which is an agent primarily in the rural area and that is what has been transformation in india sir that has been because you have you have not it's not hard wired anymore it's like it's interoperable it opens more revenues you can service all the customers in the catchment area you're right rajesh okay thank you. so there has been an interesting journey india has had and and as we are aware just to add to that journey is that uh, i can probably say that india's 2014 pm jandan yojana was the first time a head of state really took upon themselves to say that financial inclusion is the critical agenda for the country i remember working in africa those days a lot of my colleagues 
said that, are you sure that your prime minister has launched a mission? We wish our prime ministers and heads of state do that. So that was one of the most ambitious projects, as we know. And we'll talk more about you know the challenges, despite the fact we have 400 million. And before we go there, Chetna Ji, you have had 35 years in rural Maharashtra. And I would say, uh, you know, you are closest to the ground. Uh, and unlike policymakers, some of us, you know, I wear, I wore that hat once upon a time, who would be, you know, would not know what's happening in the field. So tell us in your view, from when you started the Mahila Cooperative Bank to today, what are the key things in financial inclusion that you have seen that they have changed? So thanks, Rajesh, and thanks to see you in this role. I've always seen you, Ra, Reserve Bank of India, Aadhaar, and now Think Tank. So mm -hmm. thanks for inviting me uh, for this and uh, would like to share. So the one thing which uh, I feel like, you know, every time we talk about India, India's um, uh, the majority population is staying in rural India. We talk about Bharat. And then we talk about inclusion. And I would just like to share that three decades, I have learned a lot from the people. And how I have learned, I would also, as you show, saw on the video also, and I would just like to share that I never thought I'll start a Mahila bank or a women's cooperative bank, but women came and they said that we want to do savings. You know, we have presumptions, right? That poor people, they will always talk about credit. But here, women were saying that we want to do savings, small amounts of savings, and banks are not opening the account. So I felt that it's not that poor people always want money. Poor people want opportunity, right? That is the whole thing. And how do you create those? That is one. And second, when you give the opportunity, how they can use it. So you have to think in the mindset of, them that you know it's not that you are going to decide what should be given let me give you another example that when we started bank and when uh, we started that women couldn't come to the bank we started a doorstep banking and we started uh, giving them the boxes that women will save in the box so that because they have a very less wages or in daily income and uh, when the box get full bank will transfer the amount but when you know within eight days uh, one lady came with a broken box and she was really upset and she was like what have you done what is this whose stupid idea is this and i said mine and you know what she said that before your bank representative comes my box was broken by my family members and they took away my hard-earned money and mm -hmm. she said who is responsible for that and i felt her question was right that when you uh, when you start anything for the consumer for women for people for financial inclusion you are responsible for either it is her savings or it is credit that because all these opportunities which they are going to use they should have control on that they should that should give us give them a decision making power unless you think those issues and you have to and she made me think that that it's not an access to financial access to finances. It's not access to banking. It's control on finance. It's control on banking. It's control on my production. So I feel that whenever we talk of financial inclusion, you have to think in that way. And that's why, you know, and then when you talked about Jandan also, right? Yes, Jandan is a was uh, or is still there, and many people are using. I mean, accounts have been opened, but Jandan itself has a very big, uh, strong component, and that is overdraft facility of Jandan, right? And in that, if I go to my bank in my area in Satara district, I find not even one percent of women or one percent of account holders are using the overdraft facility of Jandan. There, the quest, I would say that the effort actually makes lose the spirit because the whole effort is that people should transact, people should use the money, it should increase their wealth and increase their power, right? 
and so in that i think that it is very important that when we talk about financial inclusion it should not be just technology it should not be just product and processes but it should be the humans who are behind that and make sure that are we making their lives easier yeah no thank thank jagdish for this introductory remarks so before i go on to the next question i would just like to request the audience that there is a q and a you know box uh, icon in the in the bottom you can please post your questions q and a and unlike you know some other webinars we don't want to take it in the end i will try my best to weave it into the question that i ask uh, our esteemed speakers so please feel free to uh, post your questions and those who are on youtube uh, my colleagues are taking care of the questions and uh, you know will be passed on to me and i last the discussion to the speakers so chetan ji if i can continue with one more important point you said that it's a, the general myth is that the poor need access to finance to be able to get credit so tell me you know i also know about uh, you know that it seems you had an interesting story just a small anecdote would be interesting for the audience on how you got the license for your mahila bank i think it will be interesting for audience to know it's a long struggle to even get license from regulators sure i mean i I've, i've shared this story like 1000 times and every yeah, time i get an opportunity i like it so there's no i mean yeah so actually as i mentioned uh, that uh, i never thought that i will start i will start a women's bank or a mahila bank because that was i was working with farmers and farmers organization and with women particularly in western maharashtra of satara district and in, i was located in a very small place in maswad and there a woman who was doing a business of sharpening the wheat as kanta bai she came to me and she said that i want to do savings and i said kanta bai do you even earn that much of amount of saving that mm-hmm. you want to do amount of income that you want to do savings and you know what she said she insist she was insistent that i want to i'm sharpening the weeders i'm doing my business on the street i'm staying with my family on the street but i want to buy a tarpaulin sheet because in summer we have around 47 degrees celsius which is too hot for my family to stay on the road and in monsoon there is rain so if i buy a tarpaulin sheet i will be able to protect my family and for that i want to do savings and so i thought that it is all her right to do that so i my, myself and kanta bai we went to different banks to open her account we had three banks at that time this is i'm talking about 22 years back and the banks were not ready to open her account because kanta bai wanted to save less than a half cent a day can you imagine that you know she wants to save and she was not asking any grant or subsidy from the government bank said that that is a too small amount for my it will not it will not be a viable for my bank so when branch manager said that i felt that she is not asking for any loan she is not asking for any subsidy from the government she is asking a safe place to save her hard earned money and that is all that is her right so then i thought why not start a bank for women like kanta bai and then we decided that okay we will we'll start a bank i directly went to the, the gov- director of reserve bank of india i mean it would it's a very strange thing that one would do that as you are a the, you had a regulator role and i said that we want to start a women's bank and and then i we were told that okay there is one window where you can start a mahila co women's cooperative bank so then we thought okay we'll put together everything and apply for the license and when i was moving around this is one of the most remotest and backward area of maharashtra in spite of being in satara it's quite backward and drought area and so when i i mean women were very excited and we put together whole proposal and then we applied for the banking license i was very excited to go into the reserve bank of india with the proposal and the file and our license was we was rejected you know what was the reason it, the majority of our women you know right rajesh but i'm just telling to our listeners that the license was rejected because you have to give a details of promoting members 
name, education, uh, their uh, business, everything. And when it came to education, they had a thumb impression because our women were not literate, they were not educated. So on that ground, the license was rejected. I came back, I talked to, told our women that we couldn't get the license. You know what our women said? They said, why are you nervous? We will learn to read and write and apply again. That gave me a confidence. And then we actually applied again. But at that time, I didn't go alone. With me, 17 women accompanied to Reserve Bank of India. And they and we went to the office of director. They said that you rejected the license because we cannot read and write. But they said, we cannot read and write, but we can count. That was the another lesson. And then they said, they said that challenged the officer saying that tell us to calculate the interest of any principal amount. If we fail, don't issue the license. But tell yeah, your yeah. officers to do it without calculator. We need a computer or a core banking, but we can do it. Yeah, so yeah. well, this is yeah. great. It's yeah. interesting. And you know, as I told you, I heard that story, but I was keen that our audience knows that it has been an interesting journey for the bank. And you've been so closely involved and Raghun's experience. Raghun, tell me, moving to you, you know, you, uh, in your earlier avatars, you've been part of building infrastructure for India and then being a user of that infrastructure. Uh, and as far as I know, you were the first EKYC user in Access Bank and then built the most profitable agent network as agent. So could you tell me that, you know, it is normally discussed uh, that financial inclusion, banking for low-income clients is a loss-making business. Right. And that is what I've heard nearly all my life, uh, being at RBI, <laughs> being a member of the Pradhan Mantri Chandan Jojana National Strategy Committee. That's the thing that we have heard about. That's what is the common impression. But it's interesting that at your earlier in your earlier avatar, you seem to have built the perhaps the most profitable business correspondent or rural or Bharat banking network. Could you tell us what is it that differentiated, you know, your model, business model, and how we can, you know, to our listeners and others, there can be a lesson to say that Bharat banking is not necessarily loss making. You should know how to do it. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, Rajesh, you're asking me to discuss my secret sauce, but I will. Um, but I'm really impressed the way, you know, the uh, Mahila Cooperative Bank actually came into existence, ma'am. So I'll just take a cue from what Chetna ji said, and I'll link it to the question which you have asked. Mm -hmm. This yeah. whole psyche of branch banking or branch managers turning away customers who cannot keep big deposits is part because the whole legacy system of the banking is designed that way. It is banking in India is primarily designed for high ticket size, low volume. Uh, whereas if you see the telecom world, it is designed for low ticket size and high volume. How is that telecom is able to make some percentage of BIPs on a five rupee chota recharge, but our banks hesitate in uh, you know having a continuous stream of small ticket size coming into the savings account. Part of it was because, you know, the way the whole thing started, uh, like say, for example, in my, even before my IDFC stint when I was in Axis, to my surprise, I found that they had two separate CBSs. One CBS used to only keep low value accounts mm -hmm. and the other CBS, which is what the bank mostly used was for premium customers like you and me. And the idea was because even, I mean, part of the blame is also the CBS vendor folks who, who took this opportunity to go and sell the banks a light version of the CBS. Basically, uh, you know, it's a rundown version of the CBS and say, this is light, so I will charge you only X amount of rupees per account. So all mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, built on the way branch banking started thinking about the low value ticket customers. And also the feature. So everybody by default thinks if, it's, if there's a saving account, you have to give a debit card. If there is a debit card, there is a debit card issuance cost. Then back end, you have 
the entire management system of this debit card, which will again be a, another source of expense. Then the core banking system guy has his own loyalty. So when you build all this small, small cost, it becomes high. And therefore the banks tend to be, uh, you know, cautious on not accepting these customers. But the, pro but the solution also was there. And somehow I feel that bankers are not open uh, enough to see what's going on outside. So it, it, what we did in IDFC and, you know, fortunately for us was that we had no legacy system. It was a clean white slate. That's one. Second, we had some of the most progressive people at the helm of the bank, like Dr. Rajiv Lal, who had spent a lot of time with microfinance uh, organizations and seen them prosper under his low capital initiative. So when I got the chance from moving from Axis, and by the way, Axis was the first bank to do the EKYC. Now, in 2014, if you have built a mechanism to digitally onboard a customer without uh, him or her visiting a branch, today we all kind of relate to it, but in 2014, it, it, it just, was more of a PR buzz, but the way the bank should have thought through it was to how to create a Casa franchise out of it. Because without having a... Do you sorry, mind explaining in 15 seconds what is EKYC? Is there are people who don't know? And yeah. please, Casa, I mean, it's a very banking term. Request if right, you could... Right. More. So, you know, traditionally, for any account, you have to have a proof of ID, proof of address, physical form, fill it, send it to your operations team that they will bring out some errors and then again, again, it goes. Here okay. we had totally transformed this. Here we had just an interface, a fingerprint, which matched with the UIDA Aadhaar database. Upon mm -hmm. that, the response comes to the bank. The bank goes to the core banking, opens the account, relays it back. The slip comes out with the account number and you're live. So you're live in less than two minutes. So basically no ID, no address, your fingerprint uh, is your password, is your access to financial services. At least the opening of account got facilitated. And I'm, I was just wondering if Kanta Bai had that uh, EKYC at that time, uh, we would have been seen, seen a smile on our face. Uh, but it, Rajesh, even though we did it in 2014, even though it was in-house to a bank, Banks still could not see that this is the new way of building a liability branch bank, a liability uh, franchise without having a brick and mortar approach. And that's when, when I got this opportunity in IDFC and anyway, at that time, we were one of the two licenses to get a universal bank license. We were able to architect the bank around the India stack. We were able to leverage every facet of it. We were, a, we had, uh, you know, what's more evident if a regulator tells you that 25% of your branches has to come in rural areas where there is no other bank there. So that means that the Reserve Bank wanted banks to open. So banks naturally did not go to those rural areas for because of the economics. That's why they had to create a licensing condition to nudge the banks to do that. Instead, if you flip it, and if you use the India stack and what, uh, you know, you can, uh, there is a small video which we can play to, for the audience to relate to this subject, is that if you are able to create a platform which allows the act origination, the customer acquisition with, with very minimalistic intervention, and then you build all kinds of basic banking services on the same infrastructure without a brick and mortar approach, then you have solved for at least the access and the service side uh, issues, um, which the branch banking tends to uh, not get aligned. So I think uh, the audience will be uh, able to relate to this if we are able to play that small video. Okay, sure. is common between these village folk from Andhra Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. 
Is it that they are all from far away villages? Or is it that they do not have a high school or a primary health center in their villages? Or maybe they do not have good roads or even buses that connect to their villages? The answer that will surprise you is that all of them are customers of India's most tech-smart banking services in villages where there are no banks. Brought to them only by your bank, IDFC Bank. It is difficult to miss the festive and inviting IDFC Bank micro ATM point in a lane that leads to the IDFC Bank branch in Sankheda. A network of many such micro ATM points surround each branch. And each micro ATM is a bank in a box designed to deliver real financial inclusion. IDFC Bank's micro ATMs are India's first interoperable Aadhaar enabled payment platform and they provide access to accounts of any bank. At the micro ATM, it is easy to open an account instantly, deposit or withdraw cash and perform many banking transactions. Nearly a thousand kilometers to the southeast in Andhra Pradesh, further east of Vijayawada, lies Royuru. IDFC Bank's robust tech infrastructure of micro ATMs is being put to use here in a novel initiative with the government in dispersing pensions, scholarships and other direct benefit transfers, bringing them right to the beneficiary's doorstep. It is the first week of the month and many villagers are making a beeline towards the thatched palm-roofed house. Sitting at a table in the yard is Pujita Matrapu, a smart young lady who the villagers happily refer to now as the Gramalakshmi. On the table sits a very sleek tablet device in its dock. Pujita soon has things underway. A few clicks on the screen and she has pulled up the account details of 75-year-old Savitri Amma. She scans through the pension booklet and then scans the fingerprint of Savitraka. In no time at all, thanks to the efficient micro ATM machine, she hands over the money and the receipt to a happy Akka. In fact, uh, their unique micro ATM, which is on interoperable platform, helped us to bank the, no, the unbanked, I would say, uh, in, in no time. We could uh, crisscross around 43 banks using the IDFC's platform. And uh, here it's like bank reaching the uh, poor man's door. And he can do all kinds of transactions. Perhaps those transactions which could not be done in a brick and mortar ATM can also be done through a micro ATM. IDFC Bank has also innovated the unique cashless Aadhaar enabled PDS facility along with the Andhra Pradesh government. Now people here enjoy the facility of buying their rations through a cashless transaction. 91-year-old Sita Mahalakshmi, for one, is overjoyed. Using the online POS machine, money is transferred from her pension account directly to the PDS shop owner's account. She no longer has to withdraw cash or carry it to the PDS shop or make sure she has received the correct change. Now it is all quick and cashless. Thank you so much. I hope uh, all of you liked it and uh, with with due regard that there was no intention to advertise IDFC Bank, but that is the best film that we all recommended. Even Raghavan suggested so for the audience disclaimer. Yeah. But, uh, before we go there, you know, I would like to do a poll. You heard, you know, stage setting for last 30 minutes from two of our speakers. I would like to ask the audience, and I'm launching a poll, uh, which is uh, in your opinion, is financial inclusion in India has been largely achieved? You heard success stories from two of them. What do you think? Has it been moderating fulfilled or is it severely lacking? So we will have this poll for about a minute and then let's see what the results are. What does our audience think? Feel free to take an extreme stance either ways. Because I can see more and more people taking, saying, 
moderately fulfilled. I see a lot of optimism also, largely fulfilled. So I'll end the polling in uh, next 10 seconds. Uh, anybody else wants to vote, please do. That 26 people have voted. Panelists can also vote if you want. And if you want to recuse yourself, that's fine. So I'll end the poll. Okay, share results. So it's an interesting, as all of you can see, that 19% of our respondents, five of them feel that it's been largely achieved. But more than 50% feel that it is moderately fulfilled. And I'm not supposed to take positions, but my personal view is also that it is moderately fulfilled. And although interestingly, 27% feel it is severely lacking. And that's an interesting feedback into our discussion for the next phase of our discussion. So if we, you know, and I'll, I'll bring in audience questions also, there's a question from Swati. But uh, Chetna Ji, you know, about the credit products, one is obviously access to a formal account, which there has been a lot of efforts by Government of India and RBI to allow EKYC and 400 million or 40 crore accounts have been opened under then. So it is, as I call it, multiple A's account, then access to that account, which we discussed, this is due with agents and you both have taken a lot of steps to take doorstep banking, make it a reality, rather than having an agent sit somewhere and people having to trudge all the way. The next level of financial inclusion involves credit, you know, availability of credit. You did mention that uh, there is, according to the government scheme of PMJDY, there's an overdraft that comes with it. But what I know is that Mandeshi came out with interesting credit products in the recent years and it has been quite successful. Do you want to talk a bit about what made you build different products? And as Raghavan said, instead of it being the same car loan product or the same retail loan product that I'm offered or somebody in Mumbai is offered, the same being offered in Satara would not work right. So could you tell us how you download the product, what the product is about? Sure. So actually, uh how in generally as Raghavan also mentioned that when you are in a banking system then you would always want to like you know take a um, even if you take a risk that risk uh, is more of an I mean which is which has a like standardized process and everything so with Mandishi what we were doing is that we had a doorstep banking doorstep savings and then if women wants loan they can take the loan and uh, repay it or form the groups, SHG groups, self-help groups of women where women become a peer pressure and a guarantor, joint liability group where women takes a responsibility of repayment. Now, when we were doing that, and Mandishi has a lot of street vendors as the client, women vendors as the client, and we also have an intense operation in weekly markets. In India, we have these weekly markets, which mm -hmm. takes place in rural India every week, where people do their weekly buying and selling at one place on same day, um, in once in a week. And a lot of our women do business of selling the vegetables, fruits, grocery in these weekly market. Mm -hmm. So I was actually moving around in a weekly market and one of our women who is saving with Mandeshi, I saw that that lady was taking loan, Lakshmi, who was taking loan from money lender. Now I felt that, you know, this lady who knows, who saves with Mandeshi, which who gets interest and in yes, but she's taking, in spite of our, we do have a credit product also, which she knows. And in spite of that, she's taking loan from money lender and paying that high interest. So I just like tried to advise her that, you know, you know that, that do you know how much interest are you paying to the money lender? Because I saw her saying that I've, I have taken a thousand rupees loan and every day till I pay my principal amount, I will pay only interest 10 rupees. So I was like, I told her that, do you know how much are you paying the interest? And it's like 120% so annually. So then she said that, you know what, that uh, I know that. And then she said that, you know, and, and she said, I know I'm paying a very high interest. 
I know you have a bank account, a bank product of joint liability and uh, SSG group, but I want to, if I take loan in the morning and whatever amount I want to repay in the evening, money lender do, does that. That if I want before going home, whatever I have collected, some amount I would like to repay my loan. I don't want to sleep with that burden I, or keep my money at the home. And so I felt like, okay, so you can also pay the repayment in the installment with Mandeshi Bank. She said, no, I want this facility whenever I want, wherever I want, and money lender gives me that facility. And the lesson I learned from her was that, you know, when you design a product, you listen to the client. Don't try to impose your product and processes also that you want her to come somewhere to repay and all that. And so then what we did was that we did the digital diaries with these weekly market vendors that, you know, what if, what is from how, what, how is money go, coming and going? And then we also did the digital diaries with some of the money lenders also taking into them a confidence that, you know, That's we would like to understand. Yeah, it was a very different uh, uh, experience, Rajesh, I would say like, because it was like you are seeing that how people, poor people are transacting, right? With, and that is where I think bankers need to learn that how the money of poor people go. And it's not just like it goes from their pocket or not, even their locations changes, right? So that when we saw that, and then we realized that, you know, we need to design the product. So we did a cash credit product for these women based on their working capital cash flows and so that they can take the loan repay it then again take the loan repay it. that's what the jantan also has that you take a cash credit and repay it according to your cash flow and then if you need again so there is no like term term can be like three years and so when we introduced that product we were just surprised the way women who not only just they they took the loan. We were surprised to see that, you know, even their working capital multiplied 20 times more. And then we compared those digital diaries and their bank statements and showed to them that how, how much interest are you saving? Because you, what you are paying to money lenders. And that actually, I would just like to say that we normally presume that people don't know, but here this this woman, she questioned me about my knowledge, right? And she said that your solutions are totally not misfit with me. I think that that it, she gave me that boldness to un listen to her, say that, yes, my, my, it was my mistake. It was a bank's mistake. And then give more time to listen to her and design the product one and also design the process that, yes, at your doorstep, whenever you are coming on a weekly market, we will take the repayment because the whole issue is not just product, but how much life with the poor people, particularly how much easy are you making their life? It's that is the most important part. That was the learning that money lender was not. She didn't mind paying high interest because money lender was making mm -hmm. her life less complicated. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, Sorry. So I would just One. say that lessons I learn is that make the lives of poor people easy they will always listen to you unless you don't do that. I think it will not work. And with that product, weekly market cash credit product, I would say that if we take to that product scale, in India, we have 70,000 weekly market. And in each market, at least 2,000 street vendors sit and do business, right? So we can calculate the numbers that how many people we can impact their working capital and if their working capital grows 20 times how many millions this and their business will scale so that yeah. i would yeah. it not be that you build a credit product which was built on cash flows uh which the digital lenders of today are doing right and with automated system so it has been obviously an interesting journey and as you said their working capital needs grew 20 times which is obviously goes on to show that their livelihoods improve. So interesting thing, Raghavan, I will come to you. Is that you no? Know, I studied in Mumbai as well, you know. And in Mumbai, invariably, you know, when I would have a morning flight to catch, 
from my parade home to the airport, I would cross the Dadar Vegetable Market. And those of you who are in Mumbai will relate to it. Dadar Mumbai Market, a vegetable market is massive. I've always asked this question to myself, what is stopping from a bank, bank, private bank or a government bank to actually serve these vendors, the way Chetna Ji is saying, she has served. And what, I mean, is it just the, the, the pain of developing a suit, suitable credit product? Is it the cost? Could you tell us, I mean, you built a good liability product, I would say, savings, but even for urban India, you know, why, what is it that is stopping banks from doing that? So, uh, you know, there are multiple reasons um, why a bank hesitates. It's, it's, it's just, you have to actually spend time understanding that customer. Banks typically have, I have this product and you fit into it. That's the approach. Whereas, whereas Chetna Ji's approach was that let me understand the nuances of what she or she does on the ground. And then I will design the product or my systems or my processes to suit that. That is the big difference between the two approaches. And, uh, you know, there is no point, um, you know, waiting for the bank to change. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the simplest way of how this can be uh, mobilized at a larger scale, like the example she, she just mentioned about, 70,000 weekly huts. Um, you know, these are the kind of challenges which uh, DGV actually uh, in the FinTech Aftar is wanting to solve for, where we are trying to combine the APIs from like-minded banks, like, you know, I would love to partner with Mandeshi Bank, who have this approach of creating sachet size products uh, for Bharat. Coupled with financial technology um, and ease on, uh, on the other side. So we take APIs from the banks and then we set up this last mile network so that on one side, the classic issue of a bank, of a brick and mortar structure, those cost structures are done away with. You just saw in, our, in the earlier video, we converted a Kirana into a banking outlet. Rajesh mm -hmm. will be very happy that the Reserve Bank actually over the last four years has been seeing this new sort of banking evolve. And now they have come up with this terminology called banking outlet. Basically, they have done away with the word branch. And they mm -hmm. say that a branch and a business correspondent agent banking outlet is equal if you do A, B, and C, which is simple. You're open for four hours in a day, for five days a week. You do debit and credit and you have uh, you know, access to co-banking and all, you are equal to a branch. So, so I think the regulations on one side, like-minded banks um, and uh, enabling FinTech players will solve the Dadar market issue. Uh, it requires that multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, but if you ask me why, do all, why, do, why, why don't all the banks do it, Every bank has its own phase of evolution. Um, so, they, so the best way is to just take who's willing and partner and move forward. Yeah. So you're saying that banks by themselves, their cost structure, their institutional structure is such that they would not want to take the pain of going to the other market and learning about <laughs> the moves and flows. This is another, very, another very interesting example I'll give you how you incentivize banks to compete on such thing. Okay, mm -hmm. let's take the AEPS example. In 2010 to 2014, I broke my head with 20 banks to make this live in NPCI. Mm -hmm. And then it required me to actually give up the NPCI avatar, go into a scheduled commercial bank where the business had, and I took the, we took the lead in introducing AEPS into government payment. That time, state governments were giving 3% uh, you know, commission fee to do this government payments. And suddenly one bank took the lead, access took the lead, and suddenly ICIC looked and said, hey, they have taken the lead, there must be some money. Let, then ICIC took the lead. Then SBI said, why are these, these guys clamoring for that business? 
I will also jump in. And then suddenly a small network reaction happened. And, and then now you have the IDFC folks, or you know, like-minded is Yes Bank and many other banks who feel that now setting up and acquiring infrastructure is equally lucrative. So market forces like the interchange are very important. You, if you if you just have the push approach that uh, why aren't you creating infrastructure, it'll never happen. But if you create market-induced uh, incentives for players to come and naturally develop, it has a multiplier effect. That, that's great. So I, I thought this is an interesting time at which, you know, let's ask the audience, sorry, this is end polling. You mentioned that, you know, let's look at what the audience says before I go on to the credit and who needs to take a lead. You mentioned fintechs. So, uh, audience are requested to answer which are the following stakeholders will lead the next phase of financial inclusion in India? Is it, should it be the RBI or the government of India? Should it be fintechs or will it be banks? Let's see what the audience says. Raghavan, you seem to be. You know, the audience seem to be with you that it's a fintechs are the future of finance in India. Uh, let's wait for a few seconds. So I would encourage others also to vote. Uh, yeah, another 10 people can vote if you want. I'll close the poll in about 15 seconds. Okay, let's let's close the poll, end the polling, and let's look at the results. So interesting, only one person has said the RBI government of India should take the lead in the next phase. The fintechs are the primary, you know, future leaders, and the banks. It's an interesting one. I would just like to spend a minute on that. The RBI government of India, and I am glad to hear that having worked both at RBI and the government of India, because in my personal view as well. Uh, you know, I think what India has done as far as the regulations are concerned and what the government of India has done by building the key, basis, the key pieces of Aadhaar, EKYC and other enablers, it's helped the system a lot. It's a critical infrastructure that has been built. Now the innovation by financial providers is, is, a, is what is still remaining to be seen. So I'll stop on that. Now, coming to a question which Swati has asked, uh, I want to keep it open to either of you. She's asking, we are building a micro lending and incubation platform for women-led home-based small businesses. Chitnari, I think more for you. Whom do we approach to help with this? Now, that's a very tricky one. Whom do we approach, uh, Swati is asking. Okay, so coming to that question, and uh, just before it, you know, your poll also has actually tempted me to give a bit a different answer. And I would say like, you know, if I, if the same question, if I would ask to our women, you know, either it is I mean, women who is in the field or in the work, work agriculture sector, uh, that who will actually build this platform, government, fintech or banks? And you know what they would have replied? They would have replied, none of this. Communities would have done that. And communities are going to build that, of course, with the engagement of FinTech. And why I'm saying this is that it's also that FinTech will have to have the faith, I mean, engagement with people, right? So communities coming together on the FinTech. So making the scale happen through either pharma producer company or through so in SAG groups and all that. But coming back to Swati's question, I do feel it's a very important question in particularly this time, Swati, that millions have migrated into the uh, villages. Uh, lockdown is there, COVID is there, and majority of the household in particularly rural India, we are seeing have been taken over by women-led businesses. You know, either it is livestock, either it is vegetable vending, either it is, and all these businesses, there are two, three things. I would just like to share with you 
that how these women are operating and you no know, in this and it's not only just when women led businesses are there what are the challenges which are there number one women do not have collateral number two women do not have a ecosystem which men have they like if men wants to start a business the whole family will say like oh go ahead even if there is a losses there is no issue but if women wants to start they will say be careful if there is a losses here is the door you will have to leave the house so they take they have so much of these challenges which is finance second is mobility third is capacity building all these are major things are there and in that i would say that you know even regarding like of course bank should give loan to women led businesses but i do feel that there is an important factor here which i have learned myself with banking that to have to share the risk and i think risk sharing how do we do with that and i would give you an example in that that if women led businesses are there and if they are documented digitally i mean i would just like to give you an example that manisha jimal she is actually working in the field rearing goats doing milk vending business but she has she is using under our chamber of commerce mandeshi foundation has she is using the app which actually has because multiple businesses are there which document all her cash flows document all her sales and everything now when she has that all the data then it happens that if she goes to the bank she would actually be able to prove that what is her cash flow what is her working capital how much is she earning that is one which i would say that women led businesses would require this type of ecosystem and with manisha who is rearing sheep and goats vending milk she actually does all that but not only that with that app she sends her bill to her client every day that today i have given you 2 liters of milk this is the cost this is you have to pay after 30 days and after 30 days she sends the bill digitally staying in a very small village and she sends the bill digitally and then tells him that you have to pay my milk money and he pays through the uh, google pay or whatever pay, upi platform which means that she is not only managing her data Manisha is not only managing her data, her accounts, but she is also sourcing her money digitally. I yeah. think in women-led business, and of course Raghavan will agree with me that one side the banks are there, but you need that whole ecosystem which we have to create digitally. Which these people are very Manisha, like other women, are very smart to use it. That even in this lockdown, she is paying her seed money. which is required in her agriculture field by doing digital transaction she is not a uh, getting a salary on her uh, the amount transferred to her account but she mm-hmm. herself is creating a digital source so i would just like to answer swati that you know these are the ecosystem where we have to create digitally with women led businesses they would require a hand holding and they are ready to learn they are smart enough to engage with you and as raghavan you mentioned that these are the people who will show the way to the banks that how do you keep your you know as the tel- tel- telecom industry has ke- created those saches these people will explain and so i would say that you know women like manisha jimal are my teachers to take this digital india forward Thank, thank you, Jitnadi. So, Swati, if I can add my two cents to this, you know, I'm taking the liberty, having spent about 27 years in this field, uh, is that as Jitnadi had earlier also mentioned, for the critical success is listen to the women what they need, go and sit with the women to understand what their credit flows are, and in the today's digital environment, it will be so much easier. So that is what I can say. So, answer is whom do we approach? we are all there i mean i'm sure i'm taking liberty at chetna ji myself raghavan any of us and definitely we of help and would love to contribute so I, uh, rajesh I, rajesh just just one input i would like to give i mean manisha is an exceptional case but when we are building for bharat so today the whole 
lending philosophy is based on data and data if it's available in the form like how manisha is generating and if there is a bank who can consume that data and make sense both are required but what about 85% of the transaction which are happening on cash so until unless platforms are agnostic and are able to also record cash and digital payments in a seamless way then the small micro enterprise businesses in bharat will be in a better position to leverage their entire working flow work, uh, you know working capital um, uh, that is one the second is that with this data how do you convince a lender an nbfc or a bank to give you loan on based on that so where is that interface with a digital diary can be consumed i i am i'm like i'm just trying to think of what system in a bank will actually accept that data until unless it's a host to host integration if she goes to branch the branch manager will be like wow what is this gizmo but <laughs> he will not be in a position he will say i still want the paper and i want it in a certain format and i want you to fill this form and i want you to get your kyc and more proofs and more collateral and this and that it is complicated interview so maybe it's a good time to segue into chennai there is another question by banani but uh, maybe i'll just uh, will will answer it very briefly uh, and then go on to what raghavan said about establishing digital footprint and and how do i present my data so account aggregator platforms have been built the india stack story exists and we have a short film 2 minute film to explain that but before that uh, chennai on banani's question that i am an entrepreneur i work with women uh, bhartiya mahila bank as we all know was launched in i think 2013 or 12 2013 but unfortunately it was closed down and it's been merged so other special credit products available to them yeah so i mean uh, bhartiya mahila bank was merged with state bank of india though, though they did have in some of the areas of northeast i have seen that they were addressing the um, uh, credit product with the uh, self help groups and all but now uh, the bhartiya mahila bank itself is merged with state bank of india and now that whole part is addressed by them that is you know providing these uh, having appointing the women uh, business correspondents we just had a meeting today afternoon with the state bank of india team and have been discussing that can we have these women business correspondents so that they can address more number of women into these as the we had seen the business correspondents of idfc so we i mean that was but actually at present bhartiya mahila bank itself is no more now a separate entity that is the answer to the question anani just to add one more point is i think if i remember there is a bhartiya mahila trust that has been set up so there are particular incentive schemes available for women entrepreneurs and i'm sure on the even the rbi website you will be able to find some uh, qna on that so uh, let's let's move on to digital payments per se and even as you said uh, building a digital footprint one option is to accept digital payments and use that as a hook and also you know to build a credit score for thin file customers one interesting point is that in both digital finance uh, you know there is a major issue that we have faced in india is of trust how have uh, ragun how have you addressed the issue of trust how would i trust this kirana store was it the choice of the kirana store itself was it the people was it processes was it technologies because i can tell you you know my father in law refused to trust any technology even today i have been trying very hard so tell me you know what what can it it work what will work so it was a very big it was a learning phase and we kept learning like how what our customers felt uh, was trustworthy point to bank with uh, there is no straight answer to this question but the fact that we over a period of time evolved a scoring criteria to come up with certain questions to determine which location had that 
implicit trust in that local catchment area in some cases it was a kirana in some cases it could have been a petrol pump in some cases it could have been a seed and fertilizer store in some cases it could be even a milk society so we we had to be our our platform and our approach had to be open to all uh, you know categories of micro enterprises to leverage and second of course the whole aspect of uh, enabling these banking services the basic raw material is actually cash cash mm -hmm. and internet connectivity now these two are required for you to function in a uh, you know continuous manner usually we saw that most of the withdrawals most of the transactions were on the withdrawal side and there were very little deposits happening so our main focus was how can we create a netting environment so that certain people come and deposit and certain people come and withdraw and that cycle keeps moving so i think th there is a lot of lot to do with the liquidity management at the lowest level which is which is the which is which has to be really perfected uh, once that happens then automatically the the trust builds in that point uh, you know we have seen certain instances where uh, you know um, in night 10 o'clock he has knocked the house of our agent and taken the money and for his medical emergency and then you know he started saving with that point uh, regularly the other fact is that why should everyone bank with you so the again the interoperability helps so if you had aps offers deposit which allowed you to use x bank interface but deposit in y bank without a charge that was a very big uh, enabler in catapulting savings that trust slowly forms in so there are multiple things started with the scoring criteria which actually evolved over a period of time branding you saw our outlet was very branded so mm -hmm. it involves cost but if you start thinking oh this is you know from day zero it should make money it's never going to be the case so you must have a certain gestation period uh involve the entire branding you must be very visible i mean there must be a grievance redress mechanism which is visible to the customer it should not be some hidden somewhere that it is not you know known to the customer so the charges if it all are there it should be displayed so these are the governance issues which we kind of solved over a period of time which helped build this trust of course then we kept pushing new and new products on the platform so that the agent was always excited and you know always had something new to offer apart from what what was already being offered uh, a combination of all this helped grow um, a successful network i will also say that we were never hung up on the number of points but we were focusing more on the quality and the throughput per point rather than stating we have x number of points so um, it is a mix of many things so which means obviously as i can uh, you know deduce from your discussion that you mentioned is that engagement high engagement high engagement of, of people who are your representatives your face in the field is is critical is critical success. yeah and and you were not focused on numbers but focus on quality of the agent as you can call it and including you know some some spending with the branding and everything but it's not easy to build customer trust and right. uh, so there is a question from deepak kumar uh, which is to do with how can the banking frauds be regulated so deepak ji the only thing i will start with is you know frauds cannot be regulated the the regulators can come out with a framework uh, the banks have to obviously build better fraud analytics network which they have been building and the consumers have to be more aware as far as regulation is concerned it's more a grievance address point which rahul just mentioned rbi has each bank has a banking ombudsman that has been set up internal ombudsman and the rbi has banking ombudsman that you can approach if you have had frauds and unfortunately in the last few months there have been because of covid after the covid 
the, the cyber frauds have increased drastically. So that's a challenge which still needs to be addressed. And it's closely related to building trust in the system. So uh, what we'll do is we have a two minute video. We'll play that, then we, which talks about India stack. And there is a question. And then we will end the, you know, in 15 minutes. So please be patient on what we need to do next. That's the next question to both of you. Where do we go next? Yeah. Can we have the video, please? India's fast growing economy is home to more unbanked people than any other country. Since 2009, India has added new pieces to its financial infrastructure. It has built three interconnected layers, a biometric identity database, simplified payments addressing, and market-wide digital payments interoperability. Together, called India Stack, these new layers have the potential to bring dramatic change. To see how it works, let's meet Seema, a garment worker who migrated to Bangalore from a rural region of Odisha. As a migrant, she does not have a permanent address, and banks often require multiple ID documents to open an account. In 2009, the Indian government created the Unique Identification Authority of India, which has enabled over 1 billion residents, including Seema, to easily obtain an identity number linked to their biometric data. Using only her identity number and biometrics, Seema can now open an account quickly. And the electronic identity allows financial service providers to instantly conduct KYC checks. A second layer of infrastructure allows Seema to link her identification number, phone number, and bank account number under a simplified payments address. This address can be easily shared with her employer to receive her salary digitally. The third layer is a market-wide interoperable payments system. Seema can now use her phone to send money instantly to her mother, who has also recently opened an account at a different provider. Her mother can withdraw the funds in rural Odisha using only her ID number and her fingerprints. Two additional layers are being added. The digital locker, where people can securely upload digital copies of personal documents, such as academic records, vehicle registrations, or birth certificates. And a new system for e-consent, enabling people to selectively share their personal documents and data. These new layers would allow Seema to share her key financial documents to apply for a loan or access other services. Together, the layers form a new national infrastructure connecting business, government, and hundreds of millions of people like SEMA to the financial system. Thank you. So this was, you know, you heard about India stack being mentioned by Raghavan especially. And it, I think for the audience, you can connect to the key things that uh, Chetanji said and Raghavan said, and, and how India has built that infrastructure, which we call as India stack. I would just like to add this film is a bit old, but I played it, it's uh, done by the World Bank, because it explains beautifully what India stack is. Digital locker, e-consent, everything is in place. And on top of that account aggregator framework, where if I'm a vendor and I take digital, I, I take cash payments and I record them digitally, they can then be stored in a common framework and, and through APIs, it can be shared through account aggregators for enabling loan. But a good question which I have, which relates to the future, is, is a question which, uh, you know, Anya is asking. India has built a digital infrastructure of financial inclusion. Uh, you know, what behavioral changes are required to accomplish a full digital transactions? And how do beneficiaries actually end up using uh, India stack services at scale. So Raghavan, maybe first should I ask you and then Chetna? Right. It's a it's an excellent question. Ananya, right? Yeah, Ananya. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think uh, you will have to uh, think it the reverse way, you know. Um, uh, so when we want people to move from cash to digital, 
what's the problem the problem is that uh, today wherever i'm talking of bharat the tier 2 to tier 6 wherever they are transacting they the the merchant is only accepting cash so if you force them to use some digital mean but on the other side the digital acceptance medium is not ready or the acceptance infrastructure is not there to act to receive it then the migration from cash to digital payment which is a long drawn process so in this regard i think now uh, you know reserve bank has come up with the payment infrastructure development fund to incentivize uh, players like us banks and many others to uh, use this fund to create the acceptance infrastructure which is still about 500 crores not that so that much but still it's a start that's one so one how do we create low cost acceptance infrastructure point two is that you must create a cash in cash out point in every 300 meter radius of every person if i want cash i should be able to withdraw just like you and i if we if we ever want to withdraw cash we have an atm network besides us so then the person only withdraws that much money how much they need at that instant they don't tend to withdraw the whole amount and hold it right that trust or that ability will only come when you have this kind of an acceptance network in the in the radius of the person then you will suddenly see that the the, the people are only withdrawing how much they need and the the migration from cash to digital payments will happen so the i think the the first point is solving for the acceptance infra especially in semi urban and bharat uh, and second is then you will see this migration happen okay so you think that's a that's a critical low cost infrastructure for acquiring uh, basically a place where you can pay digitally right uh, will be an important role so and i i think if i can add the bharat qr you know which is a common qr code uh, which is again one of india's first has been launched as i look at the number from rbi report it is 20 lakhs such bharat qr codes exist which will lead to low cost infrastructure for acquiring at merchants rather than you know the pos devices which invariably cost 10 to 15000 and there are running costs like thermal paper and everything so and tell me let's say we were to look at you know a women that you serve what would it take uh, for her to to move to what i can call a fully digital express way or a full adoption if i can call it of india stack what are the other challenges that you think should need to be solved is it more banker provided is it behavioral changes is it regulated issues so let me let me put it this way i mean um, it one is that as far as behavioral change you know when will it happen will it happen does it because of lack of education that behavior is there or there are other issues right we have to understand that and i think that the major thing there it lies is that in the in the break masses or uh, the communities who are on, on the ground on at the grassroots anything which makes their life easy they are going to adapt it why didn't it take for cell phone companies for smartphones did anybody say that i need a phone literacy nobody said that right even in villages women are using all the smartphone and all the apps also in that so i think it is because the phone is making my life easy does not make me to stand in queue does not make me to wait does not call me does not take my time all that so i would just say that when if um, we have this one program digital didis where we want our digital didis just to understand from women not just teaching them but to understand that what are the things which are blocking right to do the transaction and as raghavan very well put it that it is when you want to migrate from cash to digital it has to be on the both the sides if she doesn't get her income wages in digitally she won't be able to do digital transaction so how does and i would try like to hear share a story of anjana bhi say 
who is actually in lockdown selling vada pav and bhel in evening for the mumbaikers who have come here right and so she created a group on the mobile phone so that she can take the order and give them a doorstep delivery of uh, these snacks and she did it she doesn't have her own phone she is using her husband phone and gives the delivery at doorstep but tell her client that i will deliver but you have to give me money in my wallet digital oh. wallet right mm-hmm. because it is a lockdown right so she has to pay digitally and clients are doing that but while doing that or while telling when she also said the first transaction she did of 1 rupee why did she do that just to make sure that whatever whatever people are telling me whatever people are teaching me digital literacy is it really happening and in that 1 rupee transaction if she would have not got the message within 5 minutes 10 minutes then she would not have a trust right she would not go for second time so i do think that these things are very important in behavior change in it's not like you know that trust is going to it trust is tangible it has to come somewhere right so either it if my sms comes immediately which means i need a connectivity as a even if i am in a remote place i need to have a connect which is there in india now optic fiber cable is coming so i do feel that that immediate messages has to come even if there is some problem as raghavan mentioned that she has there has to be a consumer addressal but i would just say that i mean i'll just tell about anjana bhi se that she was smiling and she said that you know for nothing i had to go to the bank and i'm so relieved now can you imagine that when a client or a woman is saying that because it's a it's a extra work for a client to go to somewhere come back that time is so i feel that who will not like to use the handset in and do these things it will everyone would like but if you want to do it you have to digitize every point so if your dairies are there dairies have to be digitized weekly markets are there they have to be digitized when i say they have to which means the every point buyer seller and if the farmer pro and then we are in a very good time we have like 10000 farmer producer companies are coming up if a fintech company you know partner with these organizations try to make inroads with them who are also going to the farmers i think all these partnerships will be very important every time government cannot create those partnerships and i think we have to work and learn to collaborate and if we collaborate with these community organizations like farmer producer company sgs and they are smart they will do the digital transfer we will not even have to tell them no thank thanks because i i do agree with you that you know you don't have to teach people you are solving their pain by nobody taught uh, using our phone to anyone so that's definitely there so one last question from my side uh, to raghavan raghavan and then ma'am last question will be to you as well is what is your what makes you so optimistic about india's future digital bana one thing after becoming uh, an entrepreneur the vc tells me you have to be an eternal optimist so i am by definition <laughs> an eternal optimist uh, uh but besides that um you know the fact that i started enjoying working with semi urban and rural communities and uh, i could see that you know i can bring some change uh, by by mixing technology by mixing certain amount of passion certain amount of all this together um uh, and the elements to do this are present uh, so why look out so so you know i i completely buy chetna's point that we should not look at government or any one's help uh, of course they will come once it becomes a success and aadhar is the example to that that success has many fathers so <laughs> uh, so you know i 
the partnerships um, to make this happen and, and believe me bharat is actually a gold mine you know this psyche has to change that if you can build a model which is high volume low ticket size you are addressing bharat and they are a very sticky customer microfinance has time and again proved it um and i'm 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 saying that the new the, the new set of values going to be created in bharat so we are very happy to be serving bharat and understanding it no thank you raghavan i wish you all the success in being a social entrepreneur as we can call it uh, and all the best on that yena ji any words of inspiration for our you know some of our attendees are budding fintech who want to work with women entrepreneurs uh, any last words you would like to you know give them so i would just like to share again like you know you ask from where do you get the inspiration or optimism let me tell you i have like so many women who are my te- uh, leaders uh, rupali shinde is a uh, head of the digital program and in mandeshi chamber of commerce and um, rupali shinde she has not even completed a 10th standard but she leads that whole digital program and any problem if i have to do the digital transaction i call her and ask her that rupali how would i do or if i am in shop how would i use that you know qr code and all that so when you have such people like rupali she goes to azim premji university to speak there and 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 these women these women leaders when they become like a uh, talented uh, champions of digital that actually gives me the inspiration and you know what they say they say that all these money capital yes it's great but our courage is the capital mm. and their courage gives me the optimism mm. thank you for these wonderful uh, words and i suppose our audience who want to serve the low income clients that's a good enough reason and so with this optimism i would like to end the uh, the session and would like to thank venkatesh uh, raghavan venkatesh and chetna ji for their insightful and a very candid discussion and thank you all the audience for being present with us thank you bye bye thank you thank you bye